Klein and is Associate Director of the National Cancer Institute's Behavioral Research Program. Um, he has been in that role since 2009. Um, Dr. Klein's research interests fall largely on the area of self-judgment, risk perception, and risk communication. His work has appeared in more than 150 publications and has been supported by NCI and the National Cancer of the National um, Science Foundation. Dr. Klein received his PhD in social psychology from Princeton University. He was formerly on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh and associate editor of the Journal of Psychology and Health. Dr. Klein co-chairs the cognitive, affective, and social processes in health research working group at SEI and serves as executive secretary for the White House and National Science and Technology Council Social and Behavioral Sciences Subcommittee or the Committee on Science. He was a 2014 recipient of the American Psychological Association's Meritorious Research Service Commendation and has received two NIH um, Merit Awards. So Dr. Klein today is going to talk about um, a research topic that is dear to my heart, self-information and health message processing. And I've also asked him to talk briefly about um, NCI funding in behavioral research after, you know, at the end of his talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Phil Klein. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, and it's great to be here. As I think some of you know, we were talking about this earlier, I've spent more of my time in academia than in the government and I still have that kind of academic headset. So when I'm back on a college campus, a university campus, I feel like I'm at home. Um, so it's really nice to be here. I figured out how to be a government employee. I can walk the walk and talk the talk, but um, these days it's even more complicated than it used to be. Um, and uh, I enjoy it very much. It's really fun to be at NCI. I have great opportunities to drive the science at a national level um, and meet very interesting people and work in an interdisciplinary context. Uh, that's a lot of fun, but it is nice to be back on the campus again. So what I want to do is tell you a bit about um, the work I've been doing with my colleagues over the last several years on self-affirmation. And first I think it would be useful, actually first it would be useful to get my slides up. Let me do that. Uh, All right, good to go. Uh, anyway, the first thing uh, would be useful to say a little bit about what self-affirmation is. Um, as you heard, I'm a social psychologist by training, and social psychologists have long talked about um, two theories that came out of the 1950s that were developed by Leon Festinger. One of them is social comparison theory, and I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about social comparison, but I'm not going to say much about that here. And the second was cognitive dissonance theory. And cognitive dissonance theory is pretty straightforward. It's the idea that we just don't like to experience dissonance between cognitions. If I'm a smoker and I know that smoking is bad for me, I will experience dissonance. And so I need to do something about that dissonance. And so what I might do is change my attitude about smoking and consider it not so bad after all. Um, or I might change my behavior and stop smoking. One way or the other, I'm going to get rid of that dissonance. And that example is not a contrived example because that's precisely what drove Leon Festinger to develop cognitive dissonance theory. He was a heavy, heavy smoker by any definition. Um, and as a psychologist, being a smoker, even in the 1950s, he kind of knew that smoking probably wasn't so good. Um, he couldn't understand how he could go through his day and continue to engage in this behavior knowing it was bad for him. And so that precipitated this thinking about um, how, how can I resolve dissonant cognitions? Um, and he came to the belief that the way we do that is we change our attitudes or change our behaviors. But in the 1980s, Claude Steele came along, another social psychologist, and said, you know what, cognitive dissonance is not so bad. We all experience dissonance all the time. And so trying to resolve all of the cognitions that are dissonant in our heads is really going to be a lot of time, a lot of resources. That's not really what drives people. What drives people is that they want to feel like they're effective, good, productive, reliable citizens with good values and good morality. And ultimately, that, that's what matters, right? So if you do something that's immoral, immoral or unethical, that is really going to be upsetting to you. And I would argue probably more upsetting than if you do something that seems to be inconsistent with your attitude, because it really cuts at the heart of who you are. And that's what Claude Steele said. So he developed this theory, self-affirmation theory, which I know some of you are familiar with, 
Um, and the theory was that when people, when people's sense of morality and ethicality and um, consistency and reliability, basically when the sense of, of feeling like a good person is attacked, you need to reassert your sense of self. You need to feel better about yourself. And that's what cognitive dissonance does. So uh, going back to the smoking example, it's not that there's a dissonance between the smoking behavior and the attitude about smoking. It's that it cuts at the heart of you being a, a consistent, moral, ethical person. Because who would do something that violates their attitudes? That's hypocrisy, right? And we don't like to feel like we're hypocritical people. So Claude Steele argued that a lot of cognitive dissonance is just about uh, people feeling good about themselves. And he developed this theory, self-affirmation theory, um, which argued that as long as we can affirm our sense of self and feel good about ourselves, the dissonance can be kind of pushed off to the side because we, we have reaffirmed that, okay, I'm a good person, I, I, I'm an effective person, I'm moral, I have virtue, and so on. Now, this starts sounding a little squishy. It sounds like soft psychology. Um, those of you who are Saturday Night Live fans, you might remember Stuart Smalley back in the day who uh, stood in front of a mirror and said good things about himself, and that was a way to you know, feel good about himself. That's not what self-affirmation is about, although there are times when I try to explain this to biomedical scientists, and they say, oh, that sounds like Saturday Night Live. You know? um, that's not what this is about. It's really about people having a core sense of self uh, and maintaining that core sense. And to the extent that you can do that, they now can deal with the threats that are facing them on a regular basis. So with that background in mind, um, I have been engaged in a lot of research over the last several years in which we have used uh, self-affirmation as a tool to help people be less defensive in response to health communications. The seminal studies were done by David Sherman back in 2000, where he showed college students messages that were very threatening to them. Normally, these kinds of messages might lead to a defensive response, like, oh, that's not me, or though that's going to happen to other people, right? We see all kinds of defensive responses. Um, smokers, actually, there's a whole literature on how smokers can justify their smoking behavior, and they can come up with all kinds of beliefs, like uh, some beliefs are called jungle beliefs, that the world is a jungle and something's going to happen to me sometimes, so why should I worry about lung cancer? I might get killed in a car accident. Something else might happen to me. Um, there's a whole set of beliefs that smokers might have. And so uh, what Sherman found is that those kinds of defensive responses might actually be decreased by giving it, the people a chance to affirm a value that's important to them. And that's precisely what he found. In one study, for example, he showed college students a video called People Like Us, where they see individuals who have HIV, but they're attractive, they're, they're normal-looking people. Um, they look just like you if you're a college student. And um, often college students will see this film and have kind of a negative response to it. But when they have an opportunity to self-affirm in Sherman's experiment, they're less they're I'm sorry, less defensive and more likely to express interest in using condoms and protecting themselves. Um, and so that was some of the seminal work that led people to think, wow, this is not just a theory, it's not just cognitive dissonance, it's something that can be used as an intervention tool to make people less defensive in response to health communications. I guess I can use this too, can't I? Yes. Nope, wrong way. <laughs> Um, so that led to an interest in looking at other kinds of threatening messages that Sherman and others had not considered. Um, for example, anti-smoking messages. I think we're all familiar with so if I point to the right thing, uh, familiar with these warning labels. I can tell you that one of the exciting aspects of being at the National Cancer Institute is that we have had uh, some impact on the development of these kinds of labels by funding research on warning labels, by providing feedback to FDA about them. And we hope that at some point these kinds of labels will end up on cigarette packs in the United States um, once there's enough evidence to support that, and there will be. Um, but anyway, there have been a couple of studies now that have looked at anti-smoking messages, such as warning labels. Um, Dr. Nunn actually was involved in some of this work. Um, you see one of the citations up there. Um, Peter Harris and others have done some work where they showed warning labels. Um, and Kessels et al. showed uh, warning labels to participants and looked to see basically whether uh, smokers were more responsive to these warning labels when they had an opportunity to self-affirm. And that's exactly what was found. When smokers had a chance to reflect on a value prior to seeing the warning labels, they were less likely to just write off the labels and be defensive and more likely to express interest in quitting smoking. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, and so another way of providing potentially threatening feedback is to give people personalized risk feedback. So you can all get online right now, and you can put in your risk factors for pretty much any disease, 
and it will crunch out a number for you that says your risk of colon cancer is 20%, or your risk of diabetes is 15%. Um, these online calculators are very popular right now, um, and it's interesting that these things are out there and often don't take advantage of all the research on risk communication when in fact they should. Well, um, we have done some work where we gave people personalized risk feedback, um, but we also tried to use self-affirmation as a tool to help people be less defensive in response to this information. You can imagine that personalized feedback could evoke even more defensiveness because it strikes right at the heart, right? This is you. Your risk is 15%. And so you might even be more likely to want to generate all kinds of reasons why this estimate is wrong. And we've seen that in some other studies. Maybe self-affirming people will make uh, them less likely to be so defensive. And so to show you some data, um, this is a chart that shows you uh, people's interest in screening for colon cancer. And what we did in the study is we brought in community residents in the Pittsburgh area. This is when I was at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we gave them information about colorectal cancer and colorectal cancer screening. And we simply looked to see whether they expressed interest in screening after getting this information. Now, we also broke down the groups by um, the extent to which they were unrealistically optimistic or pessimistic about their colon cancer risk. And I should tell you that all of these people were off schedule for screening. These are all people over the age of 50 who should be screening and are not getting their colorectal cancer screening test. Okay? And I want to start by talking about um, these folks here. These are people who are unrealistically optimistic about their risk. And what that means is that they are underestimating their risk of getting colon cancer. All right? So they think their risk is lower than it actually is. And I've spent a lot of my, time, my career focusing on this bias, this unrealistic optimism bias. Because to me, it's fascinating that people can continue to believe that they're less at risk for something than they are, even in the face of discrepant evidence. Well, those three bars um, represent the three conditions in our experiment. One of them is a self-affirmation condition. That's this one here. These are people who are told to reflect on a value that is important to them. And I should note that it was a value that had something to do with health. So what is something they do in the realm of health that helps them to be uh, uh, better people? And that's important because um, there's other research showing that self-affirmation works best when you focus on a value that has nothing to do with the threat. And what our data have shown is that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So here we're focusing on health. We also had um, a non-affirmed condition here and a control condition. For all intents and purposes, those are very similar. We don't need to worry about the difference here. But we did some different things in those two groups. The key thing to recognize here is that this blue bar is the highest of the three meaning that those who are self-affirmed showed greater interest in getting a colorectal cancer screening test. So this basically showed that self-affirmation could be an effective tool to get people who are underestimating the risk of colon cancer to get into that doctor's office and get themselves a colonoscopy, or an FOBT, or whatever test they choose to use um, to address the colon cancer risk. Now, there's more to the story, of course. Um, if you take a look at these bars, these are people who are overestimating their risk. These are people who were saying their risk of colon cancer was more than it actually was. And I like showing these bars uh, when talking about these data because they show that self-affirmation isn't an elixir for everything. It should be used very carefully. Because what you can see here is that the self-affirmed folks now showed lower intentions to get screened uh, than those who were in the two control groups. Okay? So just throwing self-affirmation at people I'm sure Dr. Nan will tell you the same thing. Just throwing this at them and saying, oh, this is great. This is going to work to, to reduce defensiveness and get people to do the right thing. we we got to be careful about that. And at the end of the talk, I'll talk about some more recent work that looks at some of the moderators of the effects of self-affirmation, showing that um, it shouldn't be used all the time. OK. With that as a backdrop, I want to talk about some of the challenges we have in health communication and how self-affirmation might be helpful in trying to address those challenges. The first one is that we know that people avoid information all the time. Um, James Shepard, a colleague of mine, gives a talk on information avoidance that I find to be so interesting and, and amusing as well, where he talks about all the different kinds of information we avoid and the extent to which we continue to avoid that information even when we think it might be helpful to us. He starts by talking about information that we avoid that really is just icky and we just don't want. Uh, he talks about how, for example, we all know that our parents had sexual intercourse at some point. They had to for us to be here, right? <laughs> but we don't want to know when or how or where. That's, ugh, you know, just don't want to know that information. That's information avoidance, but 
I think you would agree there's no consequence to that. We don't need to know that information, and we don't want to. He also talks about how we avoid information that's just irrelevant. So he says, um, if I were to ask you, what's the capital of Cameroon? Um, you might not know, but you probably, when you walk out the door, are not going to look it up on the web because it's just not that important to you, unless you're from Cameroon or have relatives from Cameroon. So lots of information we avoid because it's just not relevant or because it doesn't have any impact on us. But there's some information we avoid that is relevant to us. If you uh, actively avoid information about your heart disease risk, despite having a family history of heart disease, that's a problem, right? And so we might want to find a way to help people to get to the next step, to actually engage with information that they should see. Notice that this is different than being defensive in response to information. This is one step back from that. It's not even getting the information in the first place, cho choosing to avoid it, right? And so maybe self-affirmation can be used uh, to help people to engage with information that they should engage with. Uh, Powell and Shepard did some early work published in Psychological Science showing that you can experimentally manipulate self-affirmation and then get people to um, take on information that might be threatening to them. We took this one step further, a team uh, at the National Cancer Institute, because we have access to this really interesting sample at NIH of people in the Bethesda, D.C. metropolitan area who have agreed to have their genomes sequenced. All right, so their blood has been taken, and we can map out their entire genome. Wow, right? Um, and mostly the purpose of the study is to figure out what genes are related to heart disease. That's, that's the, the main goal of the study. But because we have these behavioral social communication scientists roaming around, um, we were able to get involved in the study and ask questions of the people in the study, such as, how interested are you in getting this information? How interested are you in getting this information now as opposed to later? What will you do with this information? What do you think your risk is of, of finding out that you have a gene that puts you at risk for a serious disorder? What about the risk of having a carrier gene, which would be a gene that puts your child at risk, not you yourself, but your child at risk? So we could ask lots of questions about risk perceptions and attitudes and knowledge about genetics and so on. Well, the, what I want to focus on here are people's intentions to get their results. Now, they signed up to be in this genome sequencing trial, but they are under no obligation to actually get the results. The results are going to be used by scientists to figure out which genes predict heart disease, but they are no, no, under no obligation to get the results, and they can, if they want, um, find out the results. And in some cases, they really should get them because their results related to diseases they could get and that they have a family history of. So the outcome variable in our study was intentions to get this genetic information. And what we wondered about is, is it the, is it the case that when people are high in self-affirmation, just on an everyday basis. That is to say, these are people who engage in self-affirmation without them being asked to. Um, they focus on their values, they focus on their strengths, um, which makes them more resistant to, or I should say, makes them less defensive and more open um, to potentially threatening information. And genetic information could be very threatening. It's who we are, right? It's about as close as you can get to defining uh, who you are. All right, so with that, all that backdrop, I should tell you that we measured we measured self-affirmation using a scale developed by Peter Harris um, that looks at individual differences in self-affirmation. And here are some of the items um, just to give you a sense of things. So when I feel threatened or anxious, I find myself thinking about my values, my strengths. It's a, a Likert scale, agree to disagree. So we're simply just getting a sense of how people self-affirm in everyday life. And what I'm going to show you here is a graph that looks at the extent to which people um, express intentions to get results from, uh, from this genome sequencing. Now, I should tell you before describing the graph that there are all kinds of results that people can get when they get their genome sequenced. You can find out that you are at risk for something like Huntington's disease, which you can't do anything about. You can't eat more vegetables and not get Huntington's disease, right? And so that's a non-preventable or non-actionable disease. You can imagine people avoiding that kind of information. And I think I would. I don't know about you. I don't think I'd want to know whether I'm going to get Huntington's disease. And that's probably not a bad thing or a good thing. It's, it's a judgment, right? It's not a scientific question. That's really more of a judgment. But when it comes to preventable diseases, I do want to know about those. Because if I can find out that I'm at risk for something that I can then prevent by eating better or exercising or stopping smoking or whatever, and I don't smoke, but, um, doing the kinds of things that might actually reduce risk, that would be useful to know. So, the y-axis here is intentions to learn results from preventable disease. 
Uh, on the x-axis, what we have uh, is something else we measured in the study, which is the extent to which people avoid information in general. Some people are information avoiders, and some people are not. And you can put them on a scale. And this is a scale that was developed by James Shepard, who, as I said before, studies information avoidance. Um, and so the further along you are on the x-axis, the higher our, uh, people are on information avoidance. As you can see, both of these lines go down, and that makes sense, okay? Because as people get higher and higher in information avoidance, they should show lower intentions to get these results. That makes sense. But what's exciting here is that if you look at the people who are high in affirmation, that's the blue line here, the slope is, is different, right? It looks like self-affirmation is buffering them. It's making their information avoidance tendencies less impactful when it comes to them expressing intentions to get uh, their results from this genome sequencing. And so we took this as some evidence that self-affirmation can, um, can help people get past their information avoidance tendencies to be able to take on information that potentially is very threatening to them. The one thing I do really like about the study, more than one thing, but uh, one thing I really like is that this is, this is real. This is people engaging with information that's very relevant to them. It's real information, it's not hypothetical, and it's looking at self-affirmation in a way that uh, captures what people are doing in everyday life. It's not some conventional uh, uh, manipulation done in a laboratory, which is what a lot of our other research has done. Okay, um, another problem that we have in health communication, I think all of you will resonate with this, is that some people are just averse to ambiguity. So a lot of my work is in judgment and decision making, and we have this bias in judgment and decision making we talk about called ambiguity aversion. Um, think about this, if I were to tell you your risk of something is 30%, that produces uncertainty, because you don't know if it's gonna happen or not, there's a 30% chance. What if I tell you, though, that your risk is somewhere between 30 and 80 percent? That's uncertainty about uncertainty, right? It's second order uncertainty. Um, and in the judgment and decision making literature, we call that uh, ambiguity. Ambiguity is uncertainty about uncertainty. And that makes people very unhappy, right? So people are often ambiguity averse. Um, and when you tell a woman, for example, that uh, her risk of getting breast cancer, if she has the BRCA gene, is between 30 and 80 percent. Can you imagine the response, right? Because that's, that's not just uncertainty, which is very upsetting and anxiety provoking. It's uncertainty about uncertainty. Well, we have found in several studies that there are individual differences in the extent to which people are averse to ambiguity. And in this case, we're thinking more about the ambiguity of messages. Um, so, if you're someone who just can't stand it when you open the newspaper, and one day it says that eating something is healthy, and the next day it's not, right? Um, we have a measure in, uh, we have something called the Health Information National Trend Survey at NCI, or HINTS, and perhaps some of you are familiar with that. And we have an item in all of our HINTS surveys that asks people about their perceptions of ambiguity of cancer messages. Um, and the measure is something like, you know, there are so many recommendations on how to avoid cancer, I don't know what to do. It's, it's, that's not the wording, but something like that. So in this study, what we did is we broke people down into those who are ambiguity averse. That is to say, those who believe that, you know, there are too many recommendations out there and they're all confusing and I don't know what to do about it. And people who are lower on ambiguity aversion. And then we gave them a very clear, unambiguous message about the link between alcohol use and breast cancer. Okay? Turns out, by the way, that alcohol use is the understudied, underappreciated risk factor for cancer. It's a very significant risk factor for cancer, including breast cancer. Not discussed in the U.S. very much, but discussed a great deal in the U.K. and in Australia and some other places. And that's something I'm trying to do something about uh, in NCI, but that's besides the point. So we gave them this message, and then we looked to see um, whether affirmation would influence the extent to which they accepted that message. So take a look over here. These are people who are low in perceived ambiguity. Um, self-affirmation did nothing. The black bar is self-affirmation, the gray bar is no affirmation. Um, did nothing in terms of influencing their acceptance of this message about breast cancer and alcohol. But look at these people. These are the people who endorse that idea that you know, messages are ambiguous and they, they find uh, that ambiguity upsetting. And look what happens when we affirm them. It makes them more accepting of the message. So the bottom line here is that uh, if we are trying to communicate ambiguous information, uh, or unambiguous information in this case, to people who typically don't like ambiguity, self-affirmation may be a way to get past the defensiveness that people might typically uh, exhibit. 
Okay, so those are two potential problems, information avoidance, um, persuading the ambiguity averse. What about uh, restrictive laws? Laws we don't really think of as messages per se, but implicitly they are messages. If I tell you you can't do something, that's a message that I think it's bad, right? And in fact, there's a whole literature, uh, Bob Cialdini has done some of this work, showing that um, having laws actually imply something about social norms. It's a message about social norms. So he did this study, for example, in national parks, where he showed that uh, those signs that say, please do not remove any artifacts or samples from the park, those signs actually do exactly the opposite of what they're intended to do. Because people see those signs and they say, people take artifacts from the park? I'm going to do that too. And, you know, and, and they walk out. And so, so messages themselves can imply social norms. And it's really important to understand that. Well, laws do that too. Restrictive laws imply something about what's acceptable and what's not. Well, if people are threatened by laws because of the messages they suggest, maybe self-affirmation can undo that. And so what we looked at here are smokers in states that have very restrictive or non-restrictive laws regarding smoking. Okay? And here's the, the theory behind uh, what we tried to do. If you are someone who is high in self-affirmation, which means that you focus on your values and you're less defensive in response to threats, and if you are a smoker, um, you should be less defensive in response to restrictive laws in the state that you live in. All right, to say that another way, if you live in a state that has restrictive laws and you're a high affirmer, then it shouldn't bother you all that much that that law is there, and you should probably have more interest in quitting. Okay? On the other hand, if you're someone who um, is on the other end of that spectrum, you might express reactance to these laws. Right? You're a smoker, and you're being told you can't smoke. That, that makes people reactive when they're told they can't do something. This is why banned books are so popular. Right? The best thing that can happen to you as an author is if your book is banned, because that makes everyone run in droves to the bookstore to buy the book, bring it home, stick it in the bookshelf, never read it, but they have, you know, they have reassured themselves that they have control, and no one is going to tell them what to do. So our hypothesis here is that when people are high in affirmation, they're going to express more interest in quitting if they live in states that have uh, restrictive laws. And that's exactly what we found. The y-axis here is the probability of a quit attempt, again, among smokers, and then the x-axis is the extent to which people are high or low in self-affirmation. And as you can see, those who are high in self-affirmation um, showed a much higher probability of a quit attempt in states that have strong smoke-free laws. I'm not showing you all the data here. We also have um, the states that have weak smoke-free laws. And as you might expect, you get a different pattern. Okay, it's the strong smoke-free laws that matter here, because that's, that's the context where people are feeling restricted. Okay. Um, we've extended beyond that and started thinking about how self-affirmation might be related to communication in healthcare contexts. If it looks like people are less defensive and more engaged with health information when they're self-affirmed, then what does that look like when you start thinking about healthcare? Um, and so these are some data that we collected through HINTS, the Health Information National Trend Survey. Um, we put those spontaneous self-affirmation items on the survey a couple of years ago. And then we have some standard measures and hints about engagement with health information. Now, this is all correlational cross-sectional data, so it's really just a flavor of what's going on. But it's an interesting flavor, and it suggests that there's some promise here. What you can see, just scanning um, these, these items that we measured, is that people who spontaneously self-affirm, people who focus on their values and their strengths, they are more likely to seek out uh, health information for themselves and also for others more favorable perceptions of providers, greater involvement in medical appointments, greater engagement in medical research. This is a pattern that looks pretty good, right? This is what we want people to be doing, generally. And so it might be the case that self-affirmation is very effective in pulling people towards um, potentially health-threatening uh, information in the context of medical care or health care. Now, taking that one step further, we then looked at the cancer survivors in our sample. Cancer survivors are particularly in need of health information, right? They need to get more information as much as possible about new clinical trials, about new changes in their diet they can adopt in order to reduce the recurrence risk, and so on. And what we found in this study is that people who were cancer survivors and were higher in self-affirmation, they showed a higher interest in uh, seeking out information. They had more self-efficacy for getting the health information. They were also more hopeful, more happy. Uh, and this is an interesting one down here. You probably have heard of chemo brain, the idea that people 
who are on chemotherapy show cognitive deficits. This is a real thing, it's not just a pretend thing. Initially, it was thought that they were just complaining because they were depressed and anxious and there was nothing to it. But you can actually see changes in the brain uh, when people are on chemotherapy and it affects their cognition. And what's been found is that people, at least here, is that people who are higher in self-affirmation even show um, less perceived cognitive impairment. It's just a survey item, so we didn't look at their brains, um, but they seem to perceive less impairment. And that's very useful considering that cognitive impairment is going to influence how you engage with health information and how well you process it, right? So we think these findings are important. Okay, now so far this sounds like a wonderful, magical thing. You self-affirm people or they self-affirm on a daily basis um, and then you get these wonderful things, these wonderful outcomes. Many of these outcomes though are outcomes in the moment. So if we convince people to get screened for colon cancer, um, then they go off and they get screened for colon cancer, and then it's over, right? It's a one-time thing. What we'd like to know is what are the, what are the effects of self-affirmation over time? Because many health messages are not about getting screened for cancer or vaccinated or getting a radon test for your home, which are one-shot deals in many cases. Many messages are about things done over a period of time, stopping smoking, eating vegetables, engaging in regular physical activity, right? And for those kinds of things, we need to know whether self-affirmation has an effect over time, not just a one-shot deal. And what's really promising is there's a, a nice literature building here showing that you can see lasting effects uh, of self-affirmation over time on a variety of different behaviors. So uh, fruit and vegetable intake, both in the short and long term. And what I mean by that is short is like a week or two after the study. Long term could be three to six months after the study. Uh, and in fact, in a study that I was involved in with Peter Harris, we did find that months later, people who were given a threatening message about the importance of fruit and vegetable intake and were self-affirmed um, were eating more fruits and vegetables. Okay. Um, you can see a decrease in BMI, interesting work by Logan and, and Cohen, reduction in alcohol consumption, physical activity, medication adherence, and on and on. There's lots of evidence, actually, that this really works. And I'm only showing you the health data. Um, if you were in education, you'd be interested in the really fascinating work being done by Jeff Cohen um, and David Sherman showing that if you self-affirm minority adolescents in school at the beginning of the school year, you can see effects on their grades months later. So this is, seems to be a powerful effect and one that really needs to be understood. And with that in mind, let's just take a couple of moments to think about what's going on here. So I'm a social psychologist, and as a social psychologist, we're trained to think about mechanism. Um, and that is the case in many areas of psychology, behavioral science, and communication. We don't just want to know that something happens, we want to understand why it happens. Because if we understand why it happens, we can key in on those elements and try to tinker with those elements to get the positive outcome we're looking for. And what we have found over time is that there are a number of different processes that one can consider uh, in trying to understand the effects of self-affirmation. Uh, ranging from the physiological to the motivational. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor on each of these, just so you know that all of these processes have been addressed. So starting with the physiological, um, David Creswell has done some interesting work showing that you can see effects on heart rate and on cortisol. Cortisol tells you something about the immune system and how the immune system is responding to a threat. And what's been found is that when people are self-affirmed, they show lower heart rate, lower blood pressure, lower cortisol suggesting that they are not as agitated, they're not as threatened. They are taking on this threat in a way that perhaps is more productive and, and less defensive. Another example of looking at the physiological is looking at what's happening in the brain. Before I explain the slide, I have to tell you a funny story. Um, I was at a talk one time where the speaker said that if you put a picture of a brain in your talk, and even if it has nothing to do with your presentation at all, it increases the perceived uh, uh, credibility of the talk <laughs> significantly. So, I, so now I'm going to show you a picture of a brain, and in fact it has something to do with the talk. So maybe that will affect uh, what you think of self-affirmation, I don't know. I am not a brain imager, I'm not an fMRIer, uh, but I do have some colleagues who are interested in this, particularly um, David Creswell, Carnegie Mellon, and some of his colleagues, like Janine Dutcher, one of the students. Um, they're interested in self-affirmation, and they said, hey Bill, you want to be involved in an fMRI study on self-affirmation? I said, why not? Might as well try it and see what it looks like. <clears throat> and much to my shock and surprise, you could actually see effects of self-affirmation in the brain. What they looked at is the ventral striatum, the left and right ventral striatum, which is implicated in reward. If I show you a chocolate chip cookie, 
your ventral striatum might actually light up in other parts of your brain as well. And what was found is that when people had an opportunity to self-affirm in the scanner, and you can imagine how hard it was to design a self-affirmation intervention while people are lying flat in the scanner, right, without really being able to use their hands uh, at least very easily. Uh, but what we found is that you see more activation in the left and right ventral striatum, suggesting that self-affirmation is activating reward areas of the brain. And maybe that's why people are feeling less agitated and less defensive in response to threat, because we have rewarded them. We've given them a chocolate chip cookie in the form of a self-affirmation. Uh, so this has been replicated by a couple of different folks. Emily Falk has done some of this work at the University of Pennsylvania. And it suggests that self-affirmation really is having an effect. The next thing I want to talk about is cognition. When you focus on a message, there are many different ways in which you can focus on that message. Um, and you can focus on um, aspects of it that you find frightening, aspects that you find reassuring. You can focus on the colors, focus on the words. There are many different things you can do when focusing uh, on a message. What we looked at here is the extent to which um, people focus on the threatening aspects of a message. Okay? Now this is another study where we had uh, women focus on a message or read a message on the link between alcohol and breast cancer. What we were able to do, because we designed the message very carefully, is extract out the words in the message that were threatened, and then look to see how well they remembered those words using something called the visual dot probe test. And I won't go into detail about this task, but basically they're presented the word, the word is masked, and then you look at reaction times to see how quickly they can identify uh, whether it's a word or not. We also had words that were threatening but not in the message, and we had non-threatening words that were in the message or non-threatening words that were not in the message. So we have four different kinds of words here. And what we do is compute an intentional bias score, which tells you how biased they are towards uh, the threatening information. So anything that's above this uh, zero here on the x-axis means that people are attending more to the threatening material in the message relative to other words. And anything below it suggests that they are attending less to the threatening information. So I just, I'm just going to focus on the black bars for a moment. These are people who are moderate consumers of alcohol, meaning seven to nine drinks per week. Okay, you can decide whether it's moderate or not. For me, that would be heavy, heavy, heavy drinking. But <laughs> these were college students, so this was moderate. And um, what you see over here is that when they were not affirmed, uh, they showed an intentional bias away from threatening information. This is exactly what we expected in the literature, that they're being defensive. They're looking away from the threatening words focusing more on the non-threatening words. But look what happens when you self-affirm them. That's this black bar here. Now the attentional bias score becomes positive, and now they're paying more attention to the threatening information in the message. Okay, So this suggests that self-affirmation is having a cognitive effect as well on the way in which people code the information, the way in which they uh, engage with the information, and the way in which they remember and uh, encode the information. So very important to understand that self-affirmation is not just affecting people's motivation. It's having uh, perhaps an even more downstream or upstream, depending on how you want to think about it, uh, cognitive effect. Now, what's happening with these two bars? These are people who are high consumers of alcohol. Uh, they're drinking way more than seven to nine drinks a week, more like 15, 16, 20 drinks a week. And you can see that self-affirmation didn't do much of anything. Um, Maybe they were drunk in the laboratory, you know, hard to say. Um, but really, it's, I think this it illustrates something that I've alluded to a few times now, which is that self-affirmation should be handled very carefully. It might actually have no effect whatsoever, which is the case here, or it could even do harm, which I found uh, in that earlier study I talked about with regard to colon cancer screening. All right, what about affect? We've looked at affect a number of different ways, and what we have found is that self-affirmation can increase worry. If you give people a threatening message, maybe it should make them worry, right? Because worry drives people to engage in behavior to reduce their risk. And that's what we found in this study. Um, simply just looking at worry on a one to four scale, we found that when self-affirmed participants read a threatening message, they were more worried than those in the control group. We also measured intentions to change their behavior and got the same effect. And we did a mediational analysis and found that worry mediated the effect on intentions. So basically, the uh, the way in which this worked is that they got a threatening message, they became worried about it, and that worry then propelled them to do something about it, to, to change their behavior, to reduce their risk. So that suggests that uh, affect may play a role too. And lastly, what about motivation? 
Um, what I want to show you here is the correlation between people's intentions to get screened and their actual screening in the study I talked about earlier on colorectal cancer screening. This is not something we spent much time talking about in our paper, but something I found kind of on the side, and I think it's very interesting. If you look at the correlation between whether people said they were going to get screened and whether they actually get screened, those in the non-affirmation condition, the correlation is less than 0.1, okay, which is par for the course. Intentions often don't produce behavior, right? There's often a small relationship between the two. But look what happens in the affirmation condition. The correlation is about 0.45 between their intentions and their actual behavior. And this actually set us off on another path to look at the extent to which self-affirmation not only makes people less defensive, but maybe it positions them to develop the plans that they have to design and implement to reduce their risk. And in fact, we have evidence of that as well, that self-affirmation increases self-efficacy and it helps people design very specific, tractable plans they can follow through on to reduce their risk. And that's uh, very exciting. Okay, so some future directions as you think about this. One is that um, I talked about self-affirmation as if it's something that we really know and understand. I'm sure Dr. Nan would tell you uh, the same thing. We don't really know what self-affirmation is, right? We don't know what it's doing. When we do this experimental intervention where we have people write about a value in the laboratory, what is it that's affirming? Is it writing about the value? Is it about writing about the self? Um, is, is it something you can do for a minute and that's enough? Does it have to be five minutes? Do you have to be in a certain state of mind? We have no idea. We really have no idea what this is doing. But we know it's doing something, right? And we need to understand it. And we're engaged in some work right now to try to understand the different elements of self-affirmation. What it is that makes something a self-affirmation as opposed to something else. We also need to develop a model that integrates all of these different factors together to best understand what a self-affirmation is, what the effects are, um, and whether we have to tweak any of these things to make self-affirmation uh, work and be effective. And last but not least, we need to understand the circumstances that tell us when and how self-affirmation might be beneficial or potentially detrimental um, in intervention settings. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Some of these examples uh, come from work that Dr. Knott has done here. Um, one is perceived risk. So I showed you that uh, in the colorectal cancer screening study, if you, uh, if you perceive your risk to be higher than it actually is, a self-affirmation can be detrimental. And so we need to understand how perceived risk interacts with self-affirmation. What about emotional state? Um, we found in some recent work published in Health Psychology that if people are put into an angry state, which we did by showing them a clip from a movie that would make them angry, turned out that their self-affirmation essays were less affirming. So anger seemed to undo the way in which people self-affirm, and the affirmation itself was less effective. Okay? It just didn't do its job the way it was supposed to do it relative to a control condition that got a standard self-affirmation. We also, by the way, had another condition that was made fearful, made, made to feel fearful, and one that was made to feel sad. And we didn't find the same thing there. So being fearful and sad doesn't seem to undermine self-affirmation, but being angry does. And so if you have angry people walking into your laboratory and then you give them a self-affirmation, it may not work and potentially can have opposite effects. Um, Dr. Nott has done work on trait reactants, the extent to which people react to threats. I, I talked about that before and also to the framing of a message, whether it's a gain frame or a loss frame. And those can actually have a moderating effect on the extent to which affirmation might be effective. And that's something that would be important to know. If I do a study when, I, uh, when I'm trying to use self-affirmation and I design a message, that's just not going to work because the message frame isn't aligned um, with the way self-affirmation works, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to get uh, the kinds of results I'm looking for. And so it's important to understand the message itself. And I can tell you there's very little literature. This one study is probably one of three. Very, very little work that manipulates the message itself to look at the effect of self-affirmation. Usually everyone gets the same message, and it's the affirmation itself that's manipulated. But we need more studies that do a little of both. All right, so uh, that's the end of that part of the talk. Um, and I want to thank all of my collaborators. It takes a village to do this work. And many of these folks are at the University of Pittsburgh or at NCI. Um, and uh, this work is supported by NCI and also NSF. And it's been a lot of fun to do because uh, I feel it's, it, it's sort of building a case for why self-affirmation might be useful. And I'm happy to take questions about that. But I do want to make sure to get to the second piece that Dr. Nan asked me to uh, talk a little bit about and have uh, 
couple, very few couple minutes because I want time for questions. Um, I want to point you to this paper that we published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, um, which really outlines what we think of as the priorities in behavioral research in cancer control. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago, but I think it's still very relevant, very current, and it gives you a sense of how we think about things. We think about behavioral targets like alcohol and tobacco. We think about levels of influence ranging from stress and uh, individual level factors all the way up to policy and, and federal effects, um, environmental effects. We think about methodological advances, so new ways of doing research, and there are lots of new ways of doing research. I was talking to some graduate students earlier today about the fact that many of our health behavior theories are outdated because they were developed at a time that we didn't have all of the applications and technology that we have now to capture all kinds of variables that affect people's behavior. Uh, and so we need, to, uh, we need to match together all the new technologies with, uh, with new methodologies. And lastly, um, we focus a lot on cancer survivorship. And you can see some hints of that in the work that I talked about with regard to self-affirmation. Those are kind of the big buckets. Um, I can dig down a little deeper and show you some of our recent funding opportunities. I'm going to go through the slide very, very quickly because you can get all of this on our website. And you can download the funding opportunity announcements, read about them, and ask us any questions about them. But you can see there are several here that are related to cancer communication, public health, um, and some of the areas that I'm sure that you're all interested in. So we have one focusing on, um, whoops, uh, on innovations and behavioral intervention research. Um, we have one on the new media environment, which is really targeted mostly to people in cancer communication. Um, we have one on people's responses to population level cancer control strategies. By the way, I should tell you that that one is a product of that study I told you about showing that smokers in states with restrictive laws were uh, more likely to quit when they were self-affirmed. So Becky Ferrer, who's a program director at NCI, she and I said, you know what? This finding is the kind of thing we should be promoting out there. We should get people to do this kind of work to see what kinds of individual factors moderate the extent, of, of the extent that policies are uh, successful. And so that's where that R21 came. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that we have a website with all of our program directors. It has their pictures and bios so you can find out who they are. If you really are interested in funding, contact them. Find out um, whether your ideas actually align well with uh, the, the priorities we have. Most of our grants actually are investigator initiated, like 80% of them, which means that they're not responsive to any of those program announcements. They're just something you came up with in your garage and wrote an application and, uh, and sent it in. That's most of what we fund. And most people don't realize that. It's very important to understand that. But talk to our program directors. Um, get feedback on your applications. They really do want to be helpful. And that's it. So thank you, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. association of optimism with many of the same kinds of variables that I told you about. Um, but in our paper, we talked about the fact that optimism is not quite as malleable. There's a long literature on optimism showing that optimism is a bit more of a personality trait than it is something that's malleable. And we argue in the paper that even though optimism predicts some of the same things, self-affirmation might be a better place to, to go because you can manipulate self-affirmation. You can elicit people's um, focus on their values. You can get them to do that, and that's what's been shown in multiple experiments. Um, and everyone has values, and so all you have to do is find the opportunity for them to focus on those values and perhaps remind them of which values there are most important to them, and have them have a chance to talk about them and focus on them. I can tell you that um, when people are asked to focus on a value in the laboratory, I don't know if this happens in your research, um, a good percentage of them focus on relationships. So they focus on, you know, I'm a good brother, I'm a good father, I'm a good friend, uh, this is what I've done for my friend. Pretty much anybody can write an essay about how they have done something good for another person, right? And that is very affirming and may have all the downstream effects that we've talked about here. So it is, it does seem to be a very malleable construct that can be done in all populations. I've seen a study where they self-affirmed prisoners. Wow, you know, that's great. 
Um, can you make prisoners more optimistic? I don't know. But can you get them to self-affirm a value? Turns out, yes. And there's a whole literature showing that prisoners actually have higher self-esteem than non-prisoners to begin with. And so if they, in fact, have values they can focus on, you know, maybe that will make them less defensive in response to a threat. So my question follows up from that one. And you implied that we don't know much about the self-affirmation itself. But you did just seem to imply that we know it has a lot of times it has to do with relationships. I'm a good brother, I'm a good sister. Have you thought about, if you have folks write it down, doing some sort of analysis and seeing what are those messages that people are using and potentially developing some sort of typology, linking it to what we know about people's moral foundations, mm -hmm. so we can get a, a more specific understanding of what those messages are? Yeah, great question. I mean, this, it's really getting to the heart of what they're doing in this exercise. What exactly are people doing when they self-affirm? And in fact, we have taken their essays and we have we have milked them for everything they're worth. Try to pull out words, pull out themes, look at length, um, look at uh, what they focus on, what they don't focus on, and that is very helpful. And in fact, the study I told you about at the end where I, I mentioned that anger made people less likely to self-affirm or undermine self-affirmation, that was all based on coding their essays. Um, we were able to look at the extent to which they were successful in themselves. So we can do that. What I was kind of getting at is the idea that we still don't know, even if we do all of that coding, we still don't know what's happening to them. Is it that it's activating something in the brain about the self-concept? Um, is it that it's distracting them from thinking about something else? And by coding their essays, we don't have all of that context, and no one studies that context. And so that's really kind of what I'm getting at. But yes, you can code these essays and get a pretty good sense of what works and what doesn't, which values are most effective, which not. Uh, we have one study, actually, where we looked at uh, conservatives and liberals and the extent to which they focus on conservative or liberal values. And we haven't finished the data analysis yet, but what you might expect is that for liberals, focusing on a liberal value might be more self-affirming um, than a conservative value and vice versa for conservatives, right? But no one does that kind of work. That's typically not done. And I think we need more of that kind of work that differentiates different kinds of affirmations. It gets back to your question of how to manipulate self-affirmation in a way that is malleable. If you are working with someone and trying to use self-affirmation as a tool to communicate threat, um, you might want to make sure you understand some of these nuances, right? Um, if it turns out that they focus on certain values more than others, maybe, maybe you need to pull those values out of your hat as opposed to, <coughs> excuse me, as opposed to others. It's really interesting. So for those of you who are not familiar with construal level theory, it's this idea that uh, we, can, we can construe any event in a very concrete way. So I'm eating this vegetable because it's pretty and because it looks delicious and I'm hungry, you know, as opposed to I'm eating this vegetable because I want to be a healthy person and I want to have good health outcomes in the future. That's more abstract as opposed to concrete. Um, and you can take the same event and you can manipulate what people think about it in terms of concrete or abstract. And what's been found is that people who are self-affirmed are more likely to think abstractly. 
more likely to think you know, big picture and less likely to think about the concrete. But as you're pointing out, what you're trying to do often is get people to focus on the concrete and eat their vegetables, eat their fruits, you know, engage in physical activity. And so maybe the answer, and I don't know, but maybe the answer is for self-affirmation not to change in its level of control, but change in the way in which it's activated. So for example, in most experiments, people come into the laboratory, they have an opportunity to write a self-affirmation essay, um, then they get a threatening message, and then they go off, and, and you're done, right? But maybe self-affirmations could be done in a much more kind of in vivo way. Maybe you, we tried this, we took smokers, um, and we sent them text messages that were self-affirming as they were going through um, a, a cessation attempt. And we have very preliminary evidence, so I don't want to put too much into this. But we have very preliminary evidence that that was helpful to them as they were quitting. If you think about it, if you're a smoker and you're trying to quit and you self-affirm, maybe you'll blame yourself less if you lapse, and that will give you the motivation to try again, right? And that was our thinking. Um, so maybe the way around this issue of self-affirmation leading to more abstract controls is to just keep hitting people with them. So it takes them out of their current phase, their current way of thinking, makes them think more abstractly about the future, and reminds them, gee, maybe I don't want to be smoking a cigarette, or maybe I should be eating this apple. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you noted that a lot of this work had been done with Pitt. How does this translate cross-culturally? Yeah. Just given what we yeah. know about interdependent and independent self-controls, is this message, is this intervention going to translate to other cultural contexts? Yeah, it's really interesting to think about that because most self-affirmation research has been done in Western countries. A lot of it in the U.S. and also a lot of it in the U.K. Um, there are some interesting differences between the U.S. and the U.K., of course, particularly over the last year. Um, but uh, in terms of real cultural differences, you have to go further east. And we know, as you were saying, we know that in Eastern cultures, people are more interdependent. They're actually less likely to be unrealistically optimistic, more likely to um, be self-effacing, less likely to express uh, emotions. There are all kinds of interesting cultural differences. And I think there are maybe two studies in the literature, and I could be wrong, that have looked at self-affirmation in like a Chinese sample in China um, or a Japanese sample. And I think you can make some very interesting predictions. First of all, about what they would self-affirm on. I think what you're suggesting is that in Eastern cultures, they might be even more likely to self-affirm on interdependent kinds of values, and I think you're right about that. But secondly, to what extent um, will self-affirmation even have an effect? Defensiveness is often a product of protecting the self as being you know, someone that you can rely on, someone that you're happy about. And in Eastern cultures, um, the individual is different. The individual is part of a whole. It's more collectivistic. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, you know, it's more like being in the Borg. It's more like being in a group that's all connected, interconnected. And, um, and so if self-affirmation is designed to reduce defensiveness, and yet we do it in a culture where defensiveness is not quite as apparent because protecting the self isn't quite as apparent, I don't know what that looks like. You know? So I would like to see more research um, that addresses that question in other cultures. I think that's really fascinating. There's an ongoing controversy on the uh, utility of prostate cancer screening. Yes. For men. <laughs> Particularly the last week. Yeah. And the, you know, the current medical guideline, it may be changed, uh, is changing perhaps, but the current medical guideline, at least since about 2011, is that men should not get, of average risk, should not get prostate cancer screening. Mm -hmm. um, as a policy, does this seem to be counter to the principles of self-affirmation? Ooh, interesting, okay. Um, well, yeah, the evidence for prostate cancer screening is extremely weak. Um, certainly much stronger for colorectal cancer screening, for cervical cancer screening, um, and now for lung screening, uh, and also breast cancer screening, mammography. Um, but even there, there's controversy about when you should do that. Prostate cancer screening, the evidence is really weak. And so now what they're saying in the past week is that it should be an informed decision, a shared decision between you and your provider. Um, I think that's kicking the can down the road in some ways, right? It's just making you try to talk to your doctor about something when there's still very little evidence. Um, so I'm not going to state a position, because as an employee of NIH, we're not supposed to be establishing guidelines, we're not supposed to be making recommendations. But I think it's fair to say that the evidence is weak enough that I really question whether someone's just automatically go in and get tested. That being said, um, getting a prostate cancer screening test is very different than getting these other tests. Mammography, for example, you need to go in, you need to be very uncomfortable. It's a very unpleasant um, uh, 
exercise to have a mammography. Prostate cancer screening test, you can actually have it without even knowing you had it because it's a blood test. And doctors often, this happened to me, I had a physical last year and I came in and my doctor said, by the way, we looked at your PSA, your, your uh, prostate specific antigen, and it looks fine. And I said, you looked at my PSA, don't you know I work for NCI? <laughs> you didn't even ask me? And I like my doctor, he's actually very good, but um, doctors often will just do it automatically and, uh, and then rely on it in ways that perhaps might be questionable. Okay, we really have to take that to too much, so sorry about that. Uh, well, thank you so much, it was really inspiring. My pleasure. Yeah.